Um, <coughs> for those of you who don't know a lot about bee biology, we talked <coughs> about um, fertilized and unfertilized eggs. Well, a fertilized egg can become a worker, a fertilized egg can become a queen. It depends on what the bees feed it and how, how they treat it. Um, so any, any just hatched egg could be made into a queen. And anything that hasn't hatched yet, they can wait till it hatched and make it into a queen. So, of a, a, a fertilized egg. So these are the conditions under which bees naturally rear queens. An emergency is that the queen dies and they need to replace her. There's no queen that sets them off, they start raising queens. Uh, supersedure is that the pheromones of the current queen have dropped. And usually the cause for that is that her fertility has dropped. Because she can't lie about her fertility, her pheromones give her away. If she runs out of sperm, she'll run out of QMP. If she starts to run out, but she hasn't completely run out, it'll start to drop off. So her QMP is their signal for whether or not they need to raise a new queen. So if she starts to fail, they'll do a super procedure. The other reason, I, I, won't, I split these out because I see a lot of difference in the way the bees behave during prime swarm season and they're trying to swarm and the way they behave when they're just trying to swarm late in the summer or, or other times when it's not prime swarm season. So I split it out into reproductive swarming, which I think is driven by their need to reproduce, where overcrowding swarming is just driven by there's just too many bees here and we need to, we need to control the population. And I see that as two different triggers. Some people lump those together, but that's my four reasons for why they would raise a queen. So, um, that's pretty much what I just said there. If you're trying to raise queens, the way to get the most cells and get them well fed is to try and simulate both emergency and overcrowding. In other words, if, if I compress the hive down, one of the advantages isn't just that it simulates them to raise more queen cells, but also the fact that there's more bees to do the work. There's more concentration of bees. They're looking for things to do. They're, 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 the queen gets better fed when the hive is more compressed. Plus, if I compress it, I kind of simulate the overcrowding thing that might make them want to raise queens because they want to swarm. So if I put them in an overcrowded situation by compressing the hive down, removing empty boxes and empty frames, and maybe even reduce, remove a super or two and shake all the bees out of it so that the bees are so crowded that the hive's overflowing, <coughs> and then I catch the queen and put her in a nuke, and I put queen cells in there, they, they'll feed them really well and they'll raise quite a few cells. Now there's a whole bunch of different ways you can accomplish this. Um, I've got several of these books online you can read for free, or I put them in the form of a book back there if you'd rather buy the book. But I put Doolittle and Allie and Miller and 2J Smith books um, and two different uh, versions of Hopkins queen rearing um, out on my website if you'd like to read some of those. Um, but the short version is, if you just took a strong hive, took the queen out, compressed them down, they're going to raise quite a few queen cells and probably do a pretty good job of it. Um, but there's other more complicated things you can do, like shaking them into a swarm box and whatever, but I'm not going to get into that today. Um, so I can basically make them queenless, and they will raise a bunch of queen cells. The problem is, I'm only going to end up with one queen. <clears throat> so the concept of queen rearing and any kind of queen rearing method is to try to end up with a lot of queens of the genetics you want um, with a minimum amount of resources. Because basically if I take a big strong hive and make them queenless, I'll ever raise a new queen, I end up with one queen if I don't intervene otherwise. And, and I made an entire hive queenless for three or four weeks to get one queen. So um, the idea of doing all this manipulation is to get more queens for the same amount of resources. Does that make sense? Yeah. So um, <clears throat> I kind of already said that. The, the, idea, the, the problem with some of this stuff is I'm not saying it's the right way to do it, but if you took a small queenless nuke and, and set it up, I only make a few thousand bees queenless and end up with one queen. Problem is, they may not feed her that well. Um, but if I were to take 
some of this depends on the situation I'm in. If I've got foundationless frames with no wires in them, and if I make the hive queenless and I compress it down, they're going to raise a bunch of queen cells, and chances are a good portion of these I could probably cut out. I could probably cut some of these out and put them in uh, mating nukes 10 days from when I did this. So I could make them queenless, come back in 10 days, and cut quite a few of these cells out, put them in mating nukes, and get maybe 10 or 15 or 20 queens instead of one. Does that make sense so far? I'll, I'll talk more about mating nukes in a minute here, but... So basically, if I make them queenless, they're going to take this worker larva and they're going to feed it differently and they're going to rebuild a cell out coming out from there that, that hangs down like a peanut instead of looking like that and they're going to put a queen in there. Now if that's on plastic foundation, I can't easily cut that cell out. Does that make sense? Because mm -hmm. it's stuck on the plastic. I've met people who claim they put, peeled one off. I've never thought it was worth my trouble. I tried once and <laughs> decided I didn't want to try it again. But if you had plastic and you made them queenless and they put five queen cells on this frame and five queen cells on this frame and five queen cells on this frame, you could still take this whole frame of queen cells and put it in the mating nuke in this frame, put it in the mating nuke in this frame, put it in the mating nuke and end up with three queens, right? <coughs> but basically they're going to just start from what's there, build a queen cell out and make a, make a queen. Um, the easiest way I know to set up a cell starter the least complicated. There's, there may be better ways, and I, and I do some other ways. Um, but the easiest is to just take a queen out of a strong hive, and they're going to be ready to raise a bunch of queens, and they're going to have enough bees to do it. They're going to be enough bees, and enough, probably enough resources come in to have the queen well fed and take care of her. Um, and if you crowd them and get them kind of in the mood to uh, swarm as well, you'll probably improve things. One of the things you're going to run into every time you talk to any, anybody about um, walkaway splits or, um, or just what I'm going to tell you to do here as far as just raising some emergency queen cells and then putting them in mating nukes, um, you're going to not hit quite, not quite as much emotion as you did with the feeding the honey and, and the AFB. But you're going to hit a lot of emotion. You're going to hit all these people who say that emergency queens are terrible queens and, and they're not going to be well fed and, and you should never do that because they're going, to, they're going to be terrible queens. I don't know where they get that. Um, I, I, I'm sure... There are people may, who even say that the queens raised from a walkaway split are inferior queens. Right. Same, well, the same it's, it's the same principle. It's an yeah. emergency queen, yeah. Um, and... and to, to give them a bit of the doubt, I will say this. If I do a walk-away split at a poor time, I can end up with some poor queens. I mean, the, the circumstances have more to do with whether I get a good queen or not than, than that it's an emergency or not. No so, way. <laughs> no way what? Whether you get a good queen or not. I'm saying it has more to do with the circumstances under which I do an emergency queen. If I do it in the middle of a dearth, I often don't end up with a very good queen, but if I, I do it when things are, there's enough pollen and nectar and whatever coming in, I, I'll end up with just a good queen. You dirt and there's no problem. You just have to work you, with strong, just strong hives. You, well, a strong hive makes a big difference, yes. That's another mistake people make, is they'll, they'll, they'll take a frame of brood and a frame of honey and maybe a couple other frames, stick it in a five frame nuke and let them raise a queen and there aren't very many bees and you know, they end up with a, with a poor queen. If you can choose, you want the strong hive building the queen cells and not the not a little weak nuke, because a little weak nuke's not going to do as good a job of feeding the queen. Um, um, as far as the the quality of emergency queens, this is what Jay Smith said. Basically, he's, I, I like this because he wrote two books on bee heat, on on queen rearing, and this is in the second one. He says it's been stated by a number of beekeepers who should know better, including myself. The bees are in such a hurry to rear a queen that they choose larva too old for the best results. Later observation has shown the fallacy of the statement and has convinced me that the bees do the very best that can be done under the existing circumstances. Um, this seems to be the prevailing theory on why you don't, on, on why they believe you don't get a good quality queen when you do an emergency queen. They think that they're going to pick a larva that's too old. I don't think that's true. I don't, and, and he doesn't either. And he, he raised way more queens than I ever did. But... <coughs> Um, he thinks 
if, the, if, if there is a real difference, it's because they can't tear down the cell and maybe they don't get fed as well. Um, one, one of the solutions to that, if you believe that, I don't worry about it. I just do walk away splits and I don't worry about it. But you can tear down the walls of a few of the right age larvae and save them the trouble of tearing down the cells and then you don't have to worry about that. Um, on the spot clean rearing is, is what Mel Disselcone is recommending. That's basically what he's doing. He's just going in and finding the right age larva and tearing the cell wall down and then they don't have to tear it down. With a toothpick? <coughs> Not an eye tool. Just tear the whole bottom out of it. I don't do it, but that's what he does. Tear two or three cells down and then you've got a, um, an area where they can build a cell that doesn't have to come out and float the larva out and then around the corner. That's nothing new. That's how they used to honing them down doing it 200 years ago. Right. Quin Quinby, was, Quinby was doing that clear back in the middle 1800s. So. No, it's not Miller. Um, and, and, and Miller was doing it after that, but he was just like cutting ragged edge on the comb. Yeah. I saw a method where they took a, a, a frame of, uh, of open brood and they put like a, on a little shim and made it uh, horizontal. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's the Hopkins method. Um, that's in the pellet book back there, it's in the Hopkins book back there, and it's in the that, that big clean brewery book back there. Is there any advantage? And, and it's to online it? on my website if you want to go But is there any advantage to that? Um, it's, it's a way that you don't have to you don't have to uh, graft and you'll get more cells probably than you will just by making them queenless and then trying to cut out cells. I'm talking about making them queenless and cutting out cells just because it's something simple anybody can do and raise some queens and then after you get a little more confidence you can. But versus that emergency, else. it's still an emergency queen, but now they have. Well, it's an emergency in the sense they build it under the conditions of an emergency because they're queenless, yes, but. But they don't have to tear down the cell, yes. It's just as good as grafting, isn't yes, it? Yes, it's just as good as grafting. It's good. Because basically you're just putting them in the position that they need to be in for them to build them. And you're not handling them. So. It's all, you know. Right. Well, and if you don't know how to graft, then you don't have to worry right. about that I screwed up the grafting. You, I think that's, it kind of helps to separate the grafting from the rest of it just so that you have some confidence that I, I got the rest of it down and now it wasn't the fault of my grafting because I wasn't grafting and now I can learn to graft. And not feel like I don't know where it failed, you know, by separating the two. Um, here's the B mat. I've got a whole page on this, plus I've got a clean room page if you want to look this up later, or you can look at this later. But um, basically, the, 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 an egg, all the eggs hatch at three and a half days. The queen um, gets capped eight days after the egg got laid. So if you make them queenless, they're going to start from a three and a half day, four day old larva. So <coughs> that means that if you make them queenless today, four days later you're going to have cat cells. And then um, eight days after that, they're going to emerge. And that's if the weather's moderate. If the weather's hot, then they might emerge as early as 14 days, but probably it'll be 15. And if it's cold, they might emerge as late as 18 days, but it'll probably be 17 if the weather's really cold. Um, if the weather turns Pretty pretty nasty at night. I've seen that happen. So this is not this is not real exact. I said plus or minus one day. It's plus or minus one day most of the time, but it could actually be plus or minus two days in extreme weather. Um, so what we want to do, and then and then she's uh, she's going to emerge then, but she's not going to be laying until 28 days after that egg was laid, probably plus or minus about five days. Um, that's not real fixed because it depends on the weather when she'll fly and. And so she might fly a lot earlier, she might fly a lot later, just depending on whether it's sunny or rainy or whatever. Um, so if I make them queenless today, and I just want to let them raise themselves, and I want to put these in mating nudes and not have them emerge before, um, before I get them in the mating nudes, because if one of them emerges, she's going to go kill all the rest of them, then I need to do it 10 days after I make them queenless. So, um, if I made them queenless today, then 10 days from today I need to put those cells in mating nudes. So if I want to set up the mating nudes today ahead of time, which you can do, I'm, I do sometimes. Sometimes I don't do it until I'm just going to put the cell in, but you'll set up your mating nudes either the day before or the day of, and then on day 10 you're going to put them in the, in the mating nudes. I'll talk more about mating nudes in a minute here, but does that make sense? So that's, this is kind of the calendar all laid out if you're just going to make them queenless and then do something with the cells. You could also 
do any other method to get those cells into those those larvae into cells, either graft them or do the Hopkins method or do the better Queens method or whatever of those. <coughs> um, and the timing is still going to come out basically the same. And that calendar's on the other. So let's talk about mating nukes. Does everybody understand what a mating nuke is? I need to explain that. Um, nobody, nobody jumped up and down and said yes, you did. So I guess I will explain them. Sorry, um, I don't know what a mating nuke. Okay. He, a, a, queen, a queen by herself is fairly helpless. She needs bees to take care of her. So from the very beginning to the end of her life, she needs bees to take care of her. So from the moment she emerges from a cell, she needs bees to take care of her. So um, in order to do this on a minimum amount of resources, raising all these queens, uh, it doesn't take that many bees to just take care of a queen until she gets out and gets mated and gets back and starts to lay. So people usually use a smaller hive for that than a full-size hive. You can use a full-size hive, but then you gotta have more resources to raise very many queens. But, you know, it takes more resources to set up every one of those places she's gonna mate. I set up uh, two-frame mating nukes and I use the, my standard brood frame, which is a medium. So I have two medium frames. I have a frame of brood and a frame of honey. So when I go to set up my mating nukes, I take a frame of brood with the bees on it, and I take a frame of honey, and I put them in a mating nuke, and then I take another frame of brood and I shake it in there for extra bees, because all the field bees are going to fly back to the old hive. So I need about twice as many bees in here as what I, as what I want in the end, because half of them are going to fly back to the old hive. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. And, I, and I don't want to confine them, because on a hot day they'll all suffocate, and I don't really want to, you could haul them two miles away, some people do that, I wouldn't, I don't want to do that, it's too much work. I just put an extra shake of bees in there and call it good. Now I can put the queen cell in there. If this is day 10 for my queen cells, I put the queen cell in there and put the lid on it. And I'm going to come back in about two weeks and see what happened. Um, so now there's some bees, some brood. The brood keeps the bees from leaving. I've got some honey, so they, they don't really need a field force because they have food, right? They have a frame of honey. So the fact that all the field bees went back to the other hive doesn't deprive them of enough food to eat because I gave them a frame of honey. So they have enough bees to get this queen made. Now you can buy these cute little styrofoam nukes from Man Lake. I think they're worthless. There's not enough bees there to even anchor the bees, and there's no comb drawn. I don't know how you ever get the comb drawn in these. I, I, don't, I don't know. I, I, I don't see the point, because I could set up a bunch of mating nukes tomorrow, assuming it was queen rearing season, just by putting a frame of brood and a frame of honey and a shake of bees and a frame of brood and a frame of honey and a shake of bees and a frame of brood and a frame of honey and a shake of bees, and they'll stay there because there's, you know, some of them will leave, yes, but there's brood there, and so all the nurse bees are going to stay. They're not going to leave, and I've got drawn comb, and I'm already set up, and I'm up and running. <coughs> these mating nukes, you somehow got to get these bees to stay long enough to draw some comb to want to stay there, and they won't have any brood there until you get a queen who's actually hatched and mated and comes back and starts laying in there. Um, I don't know how they get it, get it to work, but that's some of the big guys do that because it takes less resources, but I, I never had any luck with it. Um, so, in my opinion, the best mating nuke is two of your standard brood, brood frames because that's kind of the minimum it would take to get it going and then you don't have to get out of trouble getting them to draw. Plus, at the end of the year, if you raised a bunch of queens, now what do you do with all these frames? You've got all these frames full of brood. Every, you know, every mating nuke you got frames of brood. Now what are you going to do with these come the end of the season and you're not raising any more queens? If they're in these little tiny boxes, you, you, what do you do? You just throw them in the freezer and kill all that brood? It seems like a waste to me. I could take all these mating nukes and combine them all and make a hive out of them. Um, or, or I can let them grow into a reasonable size eight frame nuke and overwinter. Um, so these are my mating nukes, the two frames. It's a ten, it's a ten by two, so it's a, it's a, or a four by two. It's a ten frame box, and I divided it up into four two frame boxes. Now there's people selling these and call them a queen castle. You can buy this from Rushy Mountain or. Uh, there's several, and Walter Kelly, I think, makes them. Uh, several people call them different things. But basically, it's little two-frame nukes. <coughs> what I've got for inner cover there is canvas. You've got to have something to keep them from spilling over when you open this one up so they aren't spilling over into the other one and killing the queen over in this one. So you either need boards on there for inner covers that are separate, or you need something like this. I just stapled that down on the divider so it fold, this one folds this way. And, they both fold in the middle, and then over there, those fold, you know, fold in the middle. 
So it's two, four, six. Up up. So there's there's four remaining units, eight frames. And then there's entrances in four different directions. So this one's on this side, the one in the the one in the middle is on this side, the one in the middle has one on that, the next one in the middle has one on that side, and that one has one on the opposite side. So they're all in four directions. Yeah. So what if you do this and you wind up wildly successful? Like, I've got a backyard and I probably only run about six hives in my yard. So should I do something like this on a little small scale? I mean, well, that's kind of what I'm talking about, though, that's on a small scale. Just make one hive clean listen. Raise five or six queens, and if you don't need them, somebody always does. Is that what you do? Also? What happens if you do? What do you do with all these queens then? You well, worst case is you can drop them in a jar of alcohol and have awesome swarm lure. But, <laughs> but I but I call people around and see if there is somebody who wants some local raised three for three queens. Somebody will and sell them for fifty bucks a piece. That's what I do. Yeah, somebody will always buy. Trying to improve the genetics in your neighborhood, just give them to your neighborhood. Well, that, yeah, actually, that's a brilliant idea too, right there. If you, because one of your problems is everybody keeps bringing in these stupid Georgia queens or these stupid California queens that are not acclimatized to your area. So if you give all your neighbors your queens, <coughs> you'll help saturate the whole area with your with the drones you want. <coughs> so that's not a bad idea too. Um, you can bank them. That's the other thing you can do when you get a whole bunch of extra ones. <coughs> I used to think banking them was what made these queens so bad. But after I, I took a bunch of them one time early in the spring and I put them all on a bank and I left them there until fall and I kept occasionally taking one out and putting it in a hive and it would start laying immediately and it would do really well and, and so I had to conclude it really wasn't the banking that was making them bad, it was when they banked them that made them bad. It was that they would grab them before they laid more than a couple of eggs and they put them in a queen bank that made them four queens. It's not that they bank, how long they banked them, it's how early they grabbed them. So I banked them all the way actually until December, and then I had we had unseasonably warm weather in December, and some guy in Texas wanted to buy them, so I sold them all. But um, as far as I know, he he liked them. I didn't hear any complaints. Um, anyway, that that was my a few good queens. Uh, the other things you can learn to do is you can learn to graft. You can learn to. Um, the J. Smith method is you cut little strips of comb and you wax them onto a bar. The waxing part is the part that makes that one a little complicated. The Hopkins method is basically you take you take an empty drawn comb and you put it in the middle of a brood nest, you get the queen to lay in it, you pull it out, and you take your hive tool and just cut through every other row of cells and destroy all the larvae. And then you go through the rows that are left with a match head and you mash two larvae and you leave one, and you mash two and you leave one, and you mash two and you leave one. And the reason for doing this is to get the cells spaced out so that you can cut them loose and cut them separate from each other. Because if you just take this frame of larva and lay it, in, um, lay it the way we're going to talk about in a second, on top of a uh, good strong hive, they're going to draw clusters of cells that are all stuck together and you can't separate them. So you want those larvae far enough apart that you can cut each of them loose. Um, so then, if you take, if let's say you had a 10 frame deep hive, um, you, you could adjust, adjust this for other, other things, but if you uh, take a good strong hive, compress it down, and you take an empty frame, and you, you can't fit an empty frame on top of the top bars with a box in here if it's straight with the box, but if you angle it, you can get it in there. So if you angle this empty frame and set it in there, and then you take this one you just destroyed every other larva and every other row on, and you lay it flat ways with that facing down to on top of that frame, the frame creates a space. So there's just the space up above the top bars, and that's the space they're gonna build those queen cells in. So you need that space so that they aren't connected to the top bars. Does that make sense mm -hmm. so far? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <coughs> then you can fill the rest of that box in with rags or burlap sacks or whatever's handy, it doesn't matter, just so they won't get up in there and start building comb. Um, put a lid on and then they'll draw all these, all these queen cells from those and you'll probably get more than you will just making them queenless and they're a lot easier to handle and cut loose, cut each of them separate and put them in mating. Um, the other things you can do, you can buy these kits that, that, that are graphless but you're going to spend more money on them. The Hopkins method is probably the simplest, cheapest thing because you probably already have everything you need to do it. You already, you already have an empty frame someplace, you probably already have an empty box someplace, you you know, 
So you, you, can, you can do all this. It helps if that poem you're doing this with is it, at least doesn't have any wires in it because you're going to want to get them to raise these queen cells and you want to cut all these queen cells out and the wires will get in your way. Does that make sense? So foundationless is your best bet, but um, if you use like, you know, small, if you're using small cell wax foundation or something, just don't wire it. Get it drawn and then put it in there right when you want the queen to lay in it and go from there. Okay. That makes sense? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so going back to the discussion about what can, say, this community do to promote national beekeeping, it strikes me that we should all be raising queens. Yes. And uh, as much surplus as we can muster. And yes. And get them out there, right? So to the extent that this group well, doesn't... What you can find just even on our list, even on just the, the organic list, is you're going to find there's all kinds of people in, who are on, in your area who want to find a treatment-free, good queen that's adapted to your area. And if you're raising them, then that's someplace they can go. Because right now, a lot of these people just want to get started and they don't have any clue where to get good, good stock. And if you've got good stock, and by good stock I just mean barrel stock that's healthy and doing well, then you may as well be, yeah, you may as well be filling that niche. Well, it seems like this should be pretty high on that list of all the things we can do. I agree, yeah. In fact, any of you want to get a little bit deeper into raising bees, there's a desperate need for small cell treatment-free packages. And, uh, and, I, and you can sell them for a premium. You know, it's like raising organic garden, you know, your organic produce is worth more than the regular stuff in the grocery store. It really is worth more, and so you should charge more. Marco, um, yeah. So when you use just a regular um, medium box or whatever to put these, um, you know, for uh, cells to frame each, you put it, you put some kind of board in between every two frames. Yes. So what is what, what is that? Do you have enough space? How is that done? I can wind up. I'm just taking the question. Is there a box here that has that gun to it so I can check it out? I don't see one. You can buy one from Russian Mountain. It comes that way. Yeah. Uh, so I'm, I'm not saying you have to buy one. You just look at the catalog. Yeah. Yeah. I can probably yeah. yeah. take some more pictures. I've got. Is it on your site? Is there stuff on your site? It's the, picture, it's the same. Probably the picture I have on my site is the same as that one. Um, this is this is just a one by four here, but I I would have gone with Luann if I was doing it again because you go with what Luann like an eighth of an inch, and then you can just do a soccer. And and this is a little bit crowded. I have trouble getting the queen cell in here. I get it in, but it's a little bit cramped. I wish I had a little more room. I use Luann, which is an eighth of an inch instead of a three quarter inch. I've got another three eighths of an inch in here. That helps. Thank you. He, he's got some. Uh, some videos here of an Apomobia talk. 